Today we have 3D moment of uh, force. Our learning objectives here are to define the 3D orientation of the moment axis relative to moment arms and forces. So remember we talked about the axis of rotation and that's our, our moment points in the direction of the axis of rotation. In 2D, our axis of rotation was always gonna be coming straight out of the board. In 3D, the axis of rotation is now going to be in three dimensions. It can have an X, a Y, and a Z component. So the, one of the big things for us to remember is that a moment vector points on the axis of rotation. So moment vector, axis of rotation, a force vector points on the line of action. So think about those, those key differences there. Other than that, a moment vector and a force vector are exactly the same thing. We can do all the same operations with them. And then we'll also talk about uh, using a scalar or a vector approach to solve for the magnitude and the moment vector, and then when to recognize to, when to use a, a scalar or a vector approach. So actually, let's talk about that. When to use a vector or a scalar approach. Actually, you can always use a vector approach, and I mostly, you know, just go right into that vector approach because we can always use it. The picture on the left over here, though, it's got the scalar approach is okay because each force is only in one direction. So this is F2 is only in the Z direction, F3 is only in the X direction, F1 is only in the Y direction. So a scalar approach would probably work, and we can see our moment arms are pretty easy to find on that scalar uh, approach. But actually, I think a vector approach would be just as good. In fact, you need all the same information, whether you're doing a scalar approach or a vector approach. It, it's really not much more work to do the vector approach. Now, in this one over here, we see we've got this force vector, the picture on the right there, and it has components in all three directions. And we see a planar projection, so we'd have to do the figure out this F of 80 newtons and x, y, and z, and we're looking for the moment about point A over here. This one is definitely going to be better for a vector approach. I would not try to do a scalar approach for that one right there, but we will talk about both methods just so we really understand what's going on here. And then in this one, a vector or scalar approach to find MA vector, which one either works, absolutely, you can do both of them. Um, this one, we don't, this force here is only in two directions, and so it's a little bit easier. And then this whole pipe assembly is all in the XY plane, and so that makes it a little bit easier for a, a scalar approach, but I would still end up doing a vector approach for this problem here. Okay, so our homework look very similar to those problems uh, that I just showed you, and we'll do something with a pipe assembly here for our example as well, where we have you know, three components of a pipe with a force at the end of it, and we're asked to find what is MO, and actually specifically we're asked to find the moment vector, not just the magnitude of the moment there. And so this one I would definitely use a vector approach. Same one with this one. They were given two forces now, but asked to find the same thing. What is the moment about point O? So that's a part A and a part B on there. And then our homework number two here, um, given MA, what is the magnitude of F? So we can go both directions, right? We can go from the force and calculate the moment, or we can go from the moment and calculate the force. The process is exactly the same. Um, it's just what we're solving for in the end there. And so don't forget to use those parallel lines to figure out where stuff is. Like this line right here is parallel to the Z. So doesn't that mean that B is lying in the X, Z plane uh, for that homework problem. And then our third homework problem here, we have find the moment about point O and the coordinate direction angles for the moment vector. So coordinate direction angles, like I said before, moment vectors and force vectors, we can do all the same operations. So once you find your moment vector, you would find your coordinate direction angles the same way. And that's just by taking the X component divided by the magnitude, and that would be equal to the cosine of alpha, the Y component, would be the cosine of beta and the z component would be the cosine of gamma. Okay, so um, let's jump in now to writing some stuff down on the on our on our paper here. So today's topic, right, we're doing 3D moments. And um, let's actually start off with, with 3D moments. Let's start off where we, where we left off in, in 2D, or one of the things that we did in 2D. In 2D, we had our x-axis 
we had the the y-axis and we had and it, we're, we're in 2d so I'll, I'll draw the z-axis on there but when we were doing stuff in 2d we were applying forces in the xy plane so for example you know one of the things we looked at was something very similar to this where i applied an fy and then let's say i apply an fy on the x-axis um and what i want to look at for this for this first for, for our, our first activity here is that fy is causing rotations about which axis so this is causing rotations um, and can I, I'm going to use, um, you know, this is like the at symbol, but doesn't it really look more like an about symbol? Um, yeah, it's causing rotations. I see Jessica says, yes, yeah, causing rotations about the Z axis and, and, and negative or positive. Remember, we can use our right hand rule. And so what direction is that going to have a tendency to rotate? I know I'm on the little screen here. You can, you can change it on your end, right? You can make my little you can make my video big or the the share screen big either one but if i apply a force out here doesn't that cause a rotation that's going to cause a rotation this way or remember in 2d we can also say right counterclockwise is always going to be positive so isn't that causing a clockwise rotation my thumb would actually be pointing in this case my thumb would be pointing into the into the board so that would be about the negative z absolutely right okay now what if you know now that we're in 3d what if i took that fy and i moved it so let's apply what if i applied that fy out here if i apply that fy on the z-axis now what is that causing a rotation about so i apply it out here to that spot right there yeah it's about the the x-axis, absolutely, Natalie uh, chatted in there. It's about the x-axis, and is it going to be negative or positive? Now, now that we're in three dimensions, I can't say um, you know counterclockwise and clockwise anymore, but I can take the right-hand rule. I'm gonna take my right hand, and the tendency to rotate was this way. I take my right hand, and I'll spin it that way, and so I'm getting in the positive x. So this is actually a rotations um, I'm just going to do shorthand about the positive x now. And actually, I have a, a video here, and we can look at all the different ones for this. So we can see a little bit. Let's look at how forces can cause rotations about different axes. Last time, we were in 2D, and all of our forces were in the xy plane. We looked at how applying a force here would cause a rotation about the z-axis or a force pushing up would also cause a rotation about the z-axis and that's for a y force we also looked at the right hand rule and how that right hand rule can be used to determine the signs whether it's a negative or a positive so if we're pushing down here and we're causing a rotation that's clockwise we take our right hand rule curls around the z-axis the thumb is pointing in the negative z direction and so that's going to be a negative component on that vector. If I'm pushing up here, a Y force out here, then my right hand rule is going to tell me that that's a positive Z component for that force. Now let's take that Y force, and we're in 3D today, so let's take that Y force and let's put it somewhere else. What if we put it on the Z axis out here? Now, which axis is it causing a rotation about? It's causing a rotation about the x-axis. We can use our right hand rule to figure out if that's a negative or a positive. So right hand rule goes in the same direction as the tendency to rotate. My thumb points in the positive x direction. If I change the direction of the fy and I apply it up here, now my tendency to rotate is this way. So my thumb is now pointing in the negative Z direction. So we have a Y force. It can cause a rotation about the Z axis, but if we move it over here to the Z and put that Y force on the Z axis, we see it actually cause a rotation about the X axis. Now, if we had some rigid object that was attached to this coordinate system and I applied a Y force out here, now I see, well, actually that Y force is gonna cause rotation about both, about the Z axis and also about the X axis at the same time. Now, is there any way that I can have a Y force 
cause a rotation like this about the y-axis. There is not, regardless of where I put that y-force, I can never get a rotation about the y-axis. So a y-force can cause a rotation about the x and the z, but never about the y. Now, how about for an x-force? Let's look at an x-force. So I have an fx. If I apply an fx up here to the y-axis, I can cause a rotation about the z, and based on the right-hand rule, that would be negative z. I could apply the y-force out here on the z-axis, so that fx on the z-axis, and that would cause a rotation about the y-axis as well. And so that would be a positive y-axis rotation. So now with fx, okay, let's go ahead and let's stop it right there. I think that gave us a good idea physically of what's going on here. So let's draw a couple more things on our picture. Um, you know, we talked about that fx force. You know, if we applied um, an FX, let me do it right here. How about if we applied an FX force right there? That's going to cause, if we think about it, it's gonna cause a rotation about the Y and based on the right hand rule, it's gonna be about the positive Y axis. Um, we could also apply, we didn't show this in the video, but what about a Z force? What if I applied a Z force, let's say right here? So going back into the page, I applied some FZ like that. That's going to cause a rotation about the negative x-axis. And I think one of the main things that we're getting out of this is that a y-force can never cause a rotation about the y-axis. An x-force can never cause a rotation about the x. They can only cause rotations about the other two axes um, for these problems. Okay, so um, that gets us into... Thinking about this 3D stuff, now let's jump into um, a system and I'm gonna draw a really nice big picture because we're gonna be adding a bunch of stuff um, to this picture here. So I'm gonna draw an X axis going off to the right. I'm gonna draw a Y axis going straight up and then the Z axis is coming out of the page here. And what we're gonna have in this scenario is we're gonna have a, a rigid object that is in three dimensions. And so let's say we have this rigid object that goes from here from A to point B right here. So we're at the origin, we're at point A. And so this is a, a rigid object. And, and this rigid object is in three dimensions and I'll show where it is by doing some dash lines parallel to the X, the Y and the Z axis. So we can see that that, that A to B is actually coming out of the page there. And then at the end of that uh, rigid object there from A to B, and that's actually gonna be a yardstick here, we're gonna apply a force. And so this force, we're gonna have some FB. And it's gonna be some force vector FB. And it, it's such that it also has a positive X, Y, and Z component. So I'm gonna do dash lines and they're gonna come out further than that green line dot and show that it's, it's coming in the positive X, the positive Y, and also the positive Z there. Okay, now, so, for what, so what I wanna do for this one here is if we have this, this force, this force up here at B, what I would like to do is I wanna look at this in terms of a scalar approach here. And so our scalar approach, we're gonna look at each component of the force and see what rotation it causes and figure out what distance, that distance D that we talked about last time. So we still have moment is equal to F times D where that distance D is the perpendicular line of action. The other thing you're gonna hear me call that is called a moment arm, right? Because it's the arm, it's the distance away from whatever we're trying to calculate the moment about to the line of action of the force. So the moment arm is the same thing as D that you're gonna, you're gonna hear me talk about here. And so we're gonna say, what are the moments for this? About each axis, for each component of the force.
of that force, and that's that force FB. So what are those? And so we'll look at the x-axis and we'll just say, okay, well, what about the, the x-axis? And with that x-axis, we'll write out the, the equation. And then what about the, the y-axis? And then what about, um, let me give myself just a little bit more room there. And then what about the z-axis? And so we'll look at these moments um, on there and we're gonna break our force into x, y, and z. And I said this has a positive x and so I'm gonna draw on here. So this, that would be our fx component would be right there. Our fy component would be right there. And then our fz component would be parallel to the z axis. And so there's our fz. And so I'm drawing them all in the positive directions, the fx, the fy, and the fz. So, so what I, I, I have another video here, and we'll come back to this picture. We'll be adding a lot more um, to that picture here, but let's take a look at this. Let's look at a physical demonstration. So this is the same physical demonstration as the picture that we just draw. We have a, that, that yardstick is our green line, and then we have the force at the end of it. To see how we calculate three-dimensional moments. I have my x-axis going off to my left, the y-axis going up, and the z-axis coming straight out of the board. I have a rigid object represented by this yardstick here and applied at the end of that rigid object, I have a force. We're going to make the rigid object so it's positive in the X, the Y and the Z direction and also the force is gonna be positive in the X, Y and Z directions. What I wanna do is I wanna break that force into its three components, an X component, a Y component and a Z component and then look at each of those components and how they're causing rotations about each of our axes. And we're gonna go X, Y, Z on each of those cases. So let's start with the X component of that force. So we're just taking the X component of that force. And if I apply that X component of that force, and I wanna look at if it's causing a rotation about the X axis, so can that X component of the force cause a rotation about the X axis? No, it's impossible for an X force to cause a rotation about the X axis. So let's move on to the Y axis here. So now I'm grabbing the Y axis. I have the X component of this force, so it's entirely going in just the X direction. And I pull on there and we see it does cause a rotation about the Y axis we can figure out if it's negative or positive based on the right hand rule. Now that we're in 3D, we cannot use clockwise and counterclockwise anymore because it's all relative to our perspective of how we're looking at it. So the tendency to rotate was this way. Look at my thumb points in the positive Y direction. So that positive X force is causing a positive component of moment in the Y direction. Now the next thing that we need to figure out is what is the moment arm? What's the perpendicular distance D from the line of action of this FX back to the Y axis? So I have this line of action here. And so imagine that line of action is out here. Every t every time in my 8 a.m. class, I don't know, my 9 a.m. class, I have like more than 100 students and it never happens in my 9 a.m. class, but it's like every day in my 8 a.m. class. I don't know, maybe my daughter is like, um, I don't know, maybe she's like watching, I, who knows? It seems like it's always between like 8 
in 8:30. Maybe it's a Zoom thing. Well, if it's a Zoom thing, I think everybody would have um, would have dropped off um, in this case. Yeah, welcome back. Yeah, time for time for a coffee break, right? Um, okay, so let's see. Where are we at here? We are. How much of the where did I where did I lose you? Can we go into the x-axis stuff? In the video, we stopped at two eighteen. At two eighteen. Oh, thank you. Perfect. Okay, so let me go back to like two sixteen. There we go. And let me make sure my screen share is audio. Share computer sound and optimize for full screen video clip. Okay. And let me show the video panel. Okay, here we go. Action is out here. How far is that line of action that's out here, right? The line of action is only in the X direction. So how far is that line of action only in the X direction? How far is it away from the Y axis? Actually, isn't that going to be a Z distance, right? So from here back to the Y axis, that's going to be a z distance okay so we're gonna okay so let's write that now let's write that down um we'll stop the video here pause the video for a second and so we're looking remember we're only looking at the fx force and we're looking and then whether that fx force causes a rotation about the x-axis about the y-axis and about the z and so oh wait what did i so the x-axis, what are the moments? Um, okay, so okay, okay, so I see I see what I did. I kind of um, I'm doing it a little bit differently um, in the video than what we're gonna write down here, but only in this the order of the steps that we're gonna do this. So um, so actually I want to look at instead, let's look at the x, just the x-axis rotation and what forces are causing a rotation about the x-axis and well actually well for, from the video what i guess oh man i i didn't realize i just realized my video i was looking at the forces right each force separately and then what it causes a rotation about but really in this example i want to do it in terms of the just looking at the x-axis and what those forces are causing. But hopefully that physical demonstration helped a little bit here. And so let's think about this in terms of just the x-axis. So what forces are causing a rotation about the x-axis? Well, we know fx is not, right? Now, how about the fy force? Is the fy force going to cause a rotation about the x-axis? Yes, it will. So the fy force, and so that fy force is out here. Um, and actually, why don't, why don't we do this? Let's just finish that video and then we'll come back to this now that I see that. Okay. We have a Y component of the moment, and, but it's going to be based on our perpendicular distance in the Z direction from that FX force. Okay, we have one more axis to look at for the FX force, and that's the Z axis. So I take the Z axis and I apply my X component of the force, and it does cause a rotation about the Z axis. That rotation based on the right hand rule is going to be a negative rotation because my thumb is pointing into the in the negative Z direction. So we see that FX force is causing a moment about the Y, it's causing a moment about the Z. Oh, and we need to also figure out what's my perpendicular distance for the Z axis. So I have my line of action here. How far is this line of action from the Z axis? Well, that's a Y distance. And so it's going to be using that Y distance for calculating the moments. Let's move on to the Y component of the force. So we have the Y component of the force. And so now this is pulling straight up here. We'll take a look if it causes a rotation about the X axis. So here, and I pull up and it does cause a rotation. I'm holding on to the X axis. It does cause a rotation about the X axis. I can take my right hand, curl in the same direction as the tendency to rotate and my thumb is pointing in the negative x direction. And then what is the moment arm? What's the perpendicular distance from this line of action to where I'm holding on? Well, isn't that going to be a z distance? It's this distance here from out here 
back this way. So that's going to be a z distance. Okay, let's move on to the y-axis. The y-axis, y-force can never cause a rotation about its own axis. So now onto the z-axis, so my y-force. So y-force, it is causing a rotation about the z-axis. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead. Let's um, stop it there. Let's go back to our picture here. And so we're gonna look at x-axis. And we saw in that video, fx does not cause a rotation, um, but the fy does. And the distance from fy to the x-axis is a z distance. We talked about that being a z distance. Now, when we're in three dimensions, we use position vectors to describe distances in three um, dimensions. And so I'm gonna, let's label this, that A to B, we're gonna call that the position vector from A to B. And because that position vector has an X, a Y, and a Z component, and so it's gonna tell us what components of that to use for each rotation. So like this one right here, this line right here, because it's parallel to the Z axis, that's actually gonna be the Z component of that position vector. This dashed line right here is parallel to the X, so that's gonna be our, our X. And then this dashed line right here, right there, is gonna be our RY. And so we see we have RX, RY, and RZ. So our FY over here in our equation, we talked about that's a, a, a distance Z away from the X axis. And so that's gonna be times an RZ. And then we also looked at whether that was negative or positive, that one was actually negative. And then what about the Z force now? So let's look at the Z force. And does that Z force cause a rotation about the X axis? Yes, it does. And it's going to be positive. So positive FZ and then times, what's the distance from the X axis to that FZ force? It's the RY distance. Yes, Jessica, yeah, um, RY. Okay, so, so we're seeing how this x-axis, if we look at the x-axis, we get this. Now, notice this pattern that's starting to show up. We have the x-axis, but there's no x component that shows up over here. And then we have the fy times an rz, and then the fz times an ry. So if we follow that same pattern, we could actually find for the y-axis here, if we did the same thing, we'd have an fx rz, and then minus an fz rx, and then if we did the same thing here, we would have uh, for the z-axis a minus fx ry and then plus an fy rx. And again, we're seeing that pattern, right? We got in the y-axis, we see the y-axis, we see an x subscript, a z subscript, and then a z and an rx. But we could go through that whole thing and, and figure all that out. And we see these nice patterns that are showing up. And so, Basically what this is, is this would be our, our M, that would be the X component of our moment. This would be the Y component of that moment. And this would be the Z component of that moment right there. And then we could find our moment vector would be equal to MX in the I plus an MY in the J and then plus an MZ in the K direction. And so that would be a scalar approach. We have to look at you know, each axis and what forces are causing rotations and then figure out the distances to those um, as well. Now, let's also talk about the where is that moment vector? Okay, so this, this moment vector, remember, it's pointing along the axis of rotation. Well, if we took that demonstration and our axis of rotation, actually, the, that, this moment vector for this particular setup with a positive force and all three components, a positive position vector and all three components, it's actually, our moment vector is going to be perpendicular to the RF plane. So let me do a line back here. And here's, right there, is our RF plane. And so the moment vector is going to be perpendicular to that RF plane. And actually where it's going to be pointing is up this way. And so I'm going to do a double headed arrow before. 
And so there, that's our moment vector. And this is also, this also represents the axis of rotation. And then let me do a perpendicular, uh, this is perpendicular. So let me draw a 90 degree angle there. So that M is perpendicular. So M is perpendicular to the R F plane. So we see these patterns starting to show up with all of our numbers. We see this X and Z's, which kind of makes you think that there's probably some sort of mathematical approach to do this instead of having this physical demonstration where we have to go in here and like hold on to the axes and rotate them and stuff like that. Anybody, any ideas of how else we could do this and we could get the exact same thing? Cross product. The cross products, yes, thank you, Keegan, right? The cross, absolutely right. So our vector approach here would be the, the cross products. And so the cross product gives us a vector that's perpendicular to the two vectors that were, that were uh, crossing together. So we could find M is just going to be equal to R cross F. Now this is not the same thing. We cannot do F cross R, okay? so. We have to do R cross F, so this one, that doesn't work. But yeah, we can just do R cross F. And so if we do that, if we do the cross product here, well, the cross product is just the determinant of a three by three matrix. And so across the top, we put the I, J, and K components. We'll put the position vector in the second row, R, X, R, Y, and R, Z. And then our force vector, fx, I'm just gonna call them fx, fy, and fz here. And so the determinant of that is our diagonal multiplication, right? And so for the i component, um, we're gonna have, what we do is we basically uh, cross out the i column, cross out the i row, and it's the diagonal multiplication of this little uh, two by two matrix in here. So it's going to be an R, Y, F, Z, and then minus, I always think the minus the uphill component, like if you think about this being the uphill component, the F, Y times an R, Z. And is that exactly the same thing that we got over here? Yeah, look at that. It's exactly the same thing that we got here it's from that cross product. So this is why, and we needed all the same information, right? For the cross product or the scalar approach, we need all the same information. We needed the R's, we needed the F's. And then we always, for the cross product, have a minus J out in front of it. And so then it's gonna be the diagonal multiplication of the RX times FZ minus FX RZ. Again, we see it's exactly the same thing as the Y axis. Now this negative in front of the J needs to get distributed to make it the same. Um, but remember, always put that negative J there and then plus K. And so we are gonna put RY um, F, Z minus F, Y, um, or no, no, I'm doing it wrong. Um, what is it? It's the K component, R, X, F, Y, R, X, F, Y, and then minus an F, X, R, Y there. And so really, as soon as we have our position vector, as soon as we have our force vector, the rest of this problem um, becomes really straightforward here. So don't tell any of your math profs that there's a real world application for the cross products, right? They're all about their like theoretical stuff. Like don't go tell Scott Strong that we're like doing real things with, with these like cross products and stuff, right? He did, they don't wanna, they, if they find out there's a real world application to this, they might stop like stop teaching it and they'll come up with some new product or you know, it's like instead of a dot product and cross product, we'll have to come up with something else, something new. Um, <laughs> yeah, Scott Strong and I always, uh, we always run into each other on campus when we were on campus. Okay, um, did everybody get that down? Sorry, I was kind of moving off of there because I want to get to our example here. <laughs> yeah, Scott Strong would see me when they were building um, uh, Coors Tech. 
he'd always, I'd be out there and I'll show you pictures of, of Coors Tech construction later this semester, but he'd, he'd come by and he'd be like, dude, what are you doing? I'm like, oh man, look at all these like structural stuff going on here. All this static stuff is like having a statics lab, you know, right outside the classroom right here. And I'll be like, taking pictures and he's like, oh wow, I never thought about that. That's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, Scott Strong is, is definitely fun to hang out with. Okay, so, um, oh nice, you got him at 11. You can let him know that I was talking about him. Um, okay, so, but don't tell him there's a real world application for the cross product. Uh, okay, so our, our lecture example here today, we're gonna do, I took a picture, this is the pipe assembly that we're going to do here. So it goes in the positive X direction, and then it goes, makes the 90 degree, it goes up in the positive Y, and then it goes straight back into the Z direction here. And so let's draw our given information um, for this problem right here. You can see the actual physical setup there. And so for this problem, we are gonna be given, let's draw our, our axes first here. So X going off that way, we've got the Y going up and then the Z axis coming straight out here. And uh, we have this, our pipe assembly. And so that pipe assembly goes along the X axis. It goes straight up in the Y direction. And then it's gonna go straight back in the Z. And so how am I gonna do that on paper? I'm gonna draw it parallel to the Z axis there. And so there I'm showing a parallel, that, that last segment is parallel to the, to the Z axis there. And then um, in this example here, we're gonna apply this force up here. It's a three dimensional force. This is gonna be the force vector at D. And, and actually we're given this force vector at D. It's a 10I plus an 8J and then um, minus a four K hat. And I like pounds, so we're gonna make this in units of pounds here. And then we're given the dimensions here. So this pipe along the X axis, we go a distance of two feet. And then from the Y up to this bend right here, that's a distance of three feet. And then from this point right here back to our point where the force is, that's a distance there of four feet. And let's also label some points on here. This is point A right here at that first bend, that's point B. This is point C. And then we called this FD because this is point D up here at the end. Okay, and we wanna find, for this problem, we wanna find the moment vector about point A, we wanna find the magnitude about point A, and then we also wanna find alpha, beta, and gamma for this, for that problem. So for our solution here, we're gonna do the, we know we're gonna do the cross product, right? We're gonna find MA and it's gonna be equal to R cross some F. So we always know it's gonna be that. But let's figure out like what subscripts, this is probably the hardest part of these problems, what subscripts are we going to have on that position vector? The position vector always needs to start at wherever we're trying to find the moment. So we're trying to find the moment at A. So that means that position vector is going to start at A. And then the position vector can end at any point on the line of action of the force. Remember the principle of transmissibility it says that we can use any point on the line of action of the force. So the, we only have one point on the line of action of the force. And yes, Natalie, you're correct. It will go from D. So from R from A to D and then crossed with that force there at D. And so we talked about these patterns. We see another pattern showing up. We want to find the moment at A. Well, our position vector better start at A. And then it can end at any point on the line of action. Okay, so ends at any point on the line of action and it starts 
at the point where we want the moment. Okay, so now um, the only thing we need is R from A to D, R A to D. Uh, you know, remember it's D minus A. This is um, R A to D is a 2i plus a 3j and then minus a 4k hat here. And so now we have everything that we need to find the moment vector about point A. Um, we could certainly try to do this with a scalar approach, but I think we, we would still need all the same information, so we might as well do it with a vector approach, a two, a three, and a minus four. And then we're gonna end up with a, our force is a 10, an eight, and a minus four. Okay, so now we have our, our moment vector about um, point A. I like to, um, I think it, it helps me not make mistakes when I just do each component at a time. So like my I component, and, and when I write everything out and don't do math and try to write the equation at the same time, so like, a is going to be, or I is going to be a three times a minus four minus an eight times a minus four. See how we have like all those negative signs in there. And if we miss one of those, it's really going to mess us up, right? We're going to get the wrong answer. So I like to write out each term and just focus on one thing at a time. So let's see, this next one is going to be a two times a minus four minus a, um, 10 times a minus four, and then our plus our k hat there, that's going to be a two times an eight minus a 10 times a three. Okay, and somebody, I hope people are paying attention in case I did make a math error there, but I think um, that all looks good. Okay, and so now, now that I've got that, um, and I know I'm kind of blazing through this, uh, through this math here, but really the, you know, if you can get this part right here, make sure you understand, right? Starts at the point where we want the moment, ends at any point on the line of action. That's the hard part, the cross product we can figure out. That's just the math stuff. Um, and so what we're gonna end up with is we're gonna end up with a, a 20i when we do all the math here. Um, a minus 32j and a minus 14 k hat. And that's going to be in units of foot pounds. You get plus 32j. Uh, don't forget about that extra negative sign in front of the j. I, I got a negative 32. Anybody else get a negative 30? Remember this, that negative sitting in front of the j component. Okay. Okay, excellent. Thank you for checking. That's this is one of the advantages of doing this live, right? Is we can have the you know these make sure if I'm making a mistake, we can point it out um, right away. Okay, so uh, what this is what this means um, is that we're creating. If we think about this pipe assembly here, is uh, actually I'll, I'll just do it. I'll just talk about it here is what this is saying is that there's 20 foot pounds about the that's causing a rotation about the x axis about that point a right so about this point a right here there's 20 foot pounds is trying to rotate it about the x axis and i have my my pipe assembly here right and so where'd my mouse go so i have like we're it's a positive 20 rotation about the x and then there's negative 32 about the y, and then there's also that um, minus 14 about the z. So there's those three, those three different components there, right? That that moment that those forces are are causing, and and so then we can also find the the magnitude. The magnitude of a is just going to be the square root of 20 squared plus 32 squared plus 14 squared. And so that's gonna give us a value here of um, 40.2 foot pounds. And 
So we found the moment vector, we found the magnitude. Now how about alpha, beta, and gamma? Cosine alpha is going to be equal to mx over the magnitude of a. Cosine beta will be equal to my divided by the magnitude of a. And then cosine of gamma will be equal to mz divided by the magnitude of a. And while our magnitude is going to be positive the whole time, um, we do have to plug in whatever sign we have up here. So actually, this would be a positive 20, but my is going to be a negative 32. And then mz is also going to be a negative 14. But then our ma's, ma for all of these will be a positive 40 point. Too. So magnitude in that case is always going to be positive, but we do have to watch out for our signs on the uh, on the the components, the x, the y, and the z components. Okay, um, I went over there again. I you know want to make sure you get your money's worth every time, but also um, would like to stop going over if possible. Um, so you all have a great weekend. Um, Enjoy the, it looks like it's going to be nice weather. Enjoy that weather. I'll see you all on Monday.